Hey Chuck, thanks for just making some emotional space and recognition around what's going on right now. I was in another class where the instructor did none of that and it was, it was um, kind of upsetting and painful actually, so I appreciate it. Yeah, it's kind of crazy to be like behaving as if everything is normal right now. I mean, it wasn't normal to begin with. And now it's like, you know, it's like, you know, what is my secondary, like my second main area study is actually like racial bias and policing and stuff, you know, so it's just like, I, you know, the situation that's going on now, you know, it's personal to me, especially when I see like the, uh, I mean, I'm following like religiously following stuff on, you know, social media. I was watching a protest stream for like two hours uh, um, last night. I, I was too cowardly to go out like last night or something like that. But um, a lot of my friends, my half my department's probably out there now. And I'm just like, how can anybody like, you know, it's like, oh yeah, you guys just turn in your homeworks, come and do all your normal stuff like that. I'm just like, this is, it's wild, right? Um, you know, this is, it's very strange in this bizarre middle of a pandemic and like failing structures of governance to be like, oh yeah, my one credit class is super important. Let's turn in our homework. Yeah, so anyway. Okay, so um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started here uh, pretty quickly. So um, lots of different people over the course of the term asked me lots of different questions about like model results and working with tables and things like that. And so being a reasonable person, I just squished them all into one lecture. Um, so uh, as you'll see when I move to the next slide, I currently have 78 slides in this lecture. So we're going to get where we go. This is one of those ones where um, I will probably lecture the entire duration of it with the knowledge that you can leave whenever you want, but I'm just going to try and get through it. It's recorded, everything like that. I want to cover it. And the stuff that I think is somewhat more important is going to be this stuff like work with model results and stuff. The wrapping up the course type stuff, it's nice. It'll be my way of being like, you guys have been great. I will miss you, but most of that, it's okay. Um, so what I'm going to cover today is sort of two things. This is really two lectures compressed into one. It used to make more sense to compress them into one before there were 78 slides, but now there's a lot. Um, but what I'm going to cover first is working with model results. So in every other sort of CSSS class, stats class, and things you'd take, you're going to be running statistical models and things. And then most of those classes don't teach you anything about how to like seriously visualize the output in like some publication ready or interpretable way, not how to make tables out of them, all that kind of junk, um, which you all need to know how to do if you're going to do any kind of like work involving data, you do reports, do articles, whatever like that. Um, so I'm going to cover that in some depth and almost all the, all the content on tables today is brand new as of the last five days. So my way of dealing with my internal anxiety over everything going on in the world was to restructure this lecture completely and obsessively. So there's a whole bunch of new stuff today. Um, then I'll go on to reproducible research and that's just sort of me ranting about what I think good science should look like. And part of that involves sort of best practices for organizing projects and doing things. That's sort of my like evangelical moment that comes at the end of the term. And then we'll just wrap things up. Okay. So I'm going to chug along, but feel free to jump in if you got any questions or anything like that. Okay. So working with model results. <clears throat> so um, Broom is a package for tidying up model results. So if you run a model with something like LM, GLM, or honestly just about every substantial statistical package in R, Broom's functions here will work to take the results of those models and tidy them up into something nice and usable and uniform. So it has a few key functions. The big one is just this function tidy. So what tidy does is if you give it any output from basically any commonly used model in R, it will change that output into a data frame where each row corresponds to a parameter and then it has like p-values, standard errors, confidence intervals, all that kind of stuff with it. It takes that sort of summary output you'd see from a normal R model object and makes it a nice data frame. The next function it has is, uh, oh, it absolutely does everything in the mass package. The mass is like one of the, is a huge package. It does everything in the mass package. It, it basically does everything but fairly obscure packages and even the obscure ones people nowadays are building broom extensions for. Um, so somebody sent me a question uh, just the other day, how do I get like model results from four different packages and one of them was a, a package for doing fast fixed effects with negative binomial models and it 
it wasn't supported in Broom yet, but there was literally a GitHub pull request for the support for that model up there. And I'd never even seen that package before. So Broom is really well supported. It's, it's the, the dominant way that all um, our packages nowadays pull summary statistics out of models. So almost everything's covered. Okay. Uh, the next big function is augment. What augment does is it takes your um, data frame of data that the model was fit on, and it will add things like fitted values and leverage statistics to those data. And then lastly, there's a function called glance, which provides a single row of fit statistics for models, which is nice if you run lots of models, it lets you create a summary data frame of fit statistics for an arbitrarily large number of models that you can then use all your dplyr stuff on to work with. Um, so the question there, is Broom part of the tidyverse or standalone? It's pretty integral to the tidyverse now. The author is, um, I forget who the main author of Broom is, but it's somebody big. I don't know if it's installed, it's actually nowadays it's probably installed with the tidyverse. Broom has incredibly like wide usage. It's um, as far as like modeling type packages, stuff associated with running stats, it's one of the most common packages out there. I'm not sure if it gets installed with tidyverse though. Okay, so Normal model output, say with LM or GLM, and if you run summary on those objects, will produce lists as output, right? So they'll look like something like this. You run like a linear model. In this case, I have some like fake data right here. I do a summary of it, and you'll get output that looks like this if I do a summary. Okay, this is something pretty and digestible to a human who's running stuff in the console in R or something like that, right? But this is not an object that's easy to work with and definitely not an object that you could send into something like ggplot, right? This is a list object and as I have repeatedly shown you over the term, lists while powerful are really unpleasant to work with, whereas data frames are really nice to work with. So list output like that is a pain to work with and if you wanna do things like plot your coefficients and stuff, good luck, right? If it's not in a data frame format, you're going to be in trouble. Next, and this is the sort of biggest problem usually, is that every single modeling function you run from every package out there produces different looking output. So this is an example of a very similar model. Here back here, I just did a standard linear model, linear regression of y on a numeric variable and a factor using LM. GLM is the general generalized linear model um, model fitting function in R. It's still a base R function. You'd think it would have consistent output. It does not have output consistent to LM. All I've done here is fit a logit model. And between the two of these, you can see there's a bunch of differences. On the original linear model over here, down here in my coefficients table, I have estimate, standard error, T value and this P value that looks like this. I have things like residual standard error, multiple R squared, F stats and stuff. These are normal residuals. I go to a GLM model and suddenly instead of T values, I have Z values down here. I don't have any of that like F stat and R squared type stuff because most of those things like the F stat still matters, but the uh, R squared and stuff are mostly meaningless for uh, GLM models. And this is not residuals, but deviance residuals, right? You would have to have a different function to grab the different components of this model versus the one in LM, even though these are like the simplest modeling functions that exist in R and they're already different between different functions, right? So the nice thing about Broom is that Broom will present similar output to say running summary on your model, but it's always the same looking output no matter what model you give it. So if I send my original linear model here to Broom's tidy function, what I get now is a tidy data frame where each parameter is a row. So here's my intercept, here's the coefficient estimate for my numeric variable, the two levels on my factor variable. They have estimates over here, they have standard errors. Notice here it doesn't say Z value or T value, it just says statistic because it doesn't care what test statistic it is. It's happy with any of them being here, it just gives you that number. So here, this was a standard linear model, so they're probably Z stats. If I'd fit it using GLM, they'd be, uh, or they'd be, sorry, it's probably T stats. It'd be Z values if I fit with a GLM, and then a normal P value column over here, right? The only time the Broom output is gonna differ from the statistic and P value presentation is if you give it a Bayesian model that doesn't produce P values, it's gonna produce something else. It's probably gonna present, uh, you might do conditional medians, it's probably gonna provide a, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, it's not a confidence interval, it's the other one. It's a, um, 
My brain is not working today. Incredible interval. Hmm. Anyway, okay. So the way Broom works is that every single class of model object that you could possibly want to run from any of these packages has its own version of the tidy function. You could find them once Broom is loaded by doing like question mark tidy.lm and you'll actually see tidy.lm is a different function. The way R works is if I say tidy on an LM object, it runs this tidy.lm thing. If I run a tidy function on a mermod object, which is like LME4, it's going to do tidy.mermod and run that function. But you don't have to know that. You can just run tidy and it will fix up damn near any model you give it, okay? So this is what the GLM model looks like if I feed it into tidy, right? So even though this model has a different looking output in R's console or when you run the GLM command, its output looks exactly the same in Broom. Even though this is a logit model, it still presents it as estimate, standard error, statistic, and p-value, right? It's uniform. This means if you have a bunch of different models that output different sorts of statistics, you can put them all into one data frame and compare them. You can do what you want. This is really nice if you were doing something like trying to run, like you've got a linear model, but you know that for a variety of reasons, your model's assumptions are violated. Maybe you're working with count data and you just wanna show that no matter how you fit this model, like negative binomial model, Poisson model, LM model, something like that, that they all show basically the same results. You can huck them all in the same data frame with tidy and pouring them out or in bring them out into the same table, which I'm going to show you in a little bit later. Okay. This is really nice for working with lots and lots of models, just fixes up all that ugly output from everything out there. Okay. So the next big function in Broom is the glance function. So what this does is it produces data frames of fit statistics for models. So if I say glance, the first linear model that I ran, it's going to produce one row of output. That's just the model that I gave it. And it's going to give me an R squared, adjusted R squared, sigma, it's the overall error, statistic, p-value, degrees of freedom, log likelihood, AIC, BIC, the deviance, and the um, degrees of freedom residual, right? It's going to provide a ton of information. And you can actually tell it to provide lots more stuff. This, again, is really nice if you run lots of models and you want to know what thing fits the best, given, you know, assuming you're using your fit statistics correctly, right? You don't want to be comparing, like, your, your standard linear model to uh, necessarily to your logit model with, like, most of these statistics, right? But um, this is kind of nice for just pinning together a lot of them. And then you can do things like maybe you want to know what model fits best by BIC. You could pipe the output of a whole bunch of glance commands into an arrange, arrange by BIC, and get the one with the lowest BIC at the top, right? This makes it a lot easier to compare lots of models. If you're somebody who does, say, like, biostats type stuff, and you run, like, 80, 100 models at once, and you need to get info on them all, stick them all into one data frame, work with it this way. It's much easier than messing with lists. Uh, so can we customize the standard output for glance? Uh, you can give it arguments to change its output, but I don't know if you could permanently set it as something. Technically speaking, you could overwrite the glance function with your own wrapper to do that if you wanted, which is how I'd probably do it. <clears throat> okay. The next one is the augment function. So this is something common if you're in a stats class, like maybe you took the social stats sequence or something like that. If you were lucky and you took it when I was the TA for that, you got to see this probably. Um, but if you uh, are in some like stats class and you need to run some models and they get things like um, fitted values, residuals, leverage statistics for observations in your data, you don't have to do anything like calculate these things manually by and large. You can just say, take my linear model object, augment it, and what it does is it keeps all the original variables. So this is my y variable, the numeric variable, the factor, and then tacks onto it all these columns that begin with period. These are the fitted values. These is the standard error of the fitted values, the residual, uh, I forget what the hat values are. Hat is a uh, leveragey type thing. Uh, the sigma, Cook's SD, which is a leverage statistic, standardized residuals, right? All these common things for diagnosing things like outliers and the general fit of things get calculated by augment. So let's say you want to do something like do that sort of cross validation we did before where I like manually calculated the fitted values and residuals that got my squared errors. I could just do this all in augment and then one mutate command instead of having to like loop through things the same way, right? So this gives you some power for doing some of the things we did earlier. 
Okay. No, the floof. Okay. Might wave the cat in the camera if she keeps going in trouble. Okay. So the real power and advantage of Broom, in my opinion, becomes apparent uh, when running lots and lots of models at once. So an example of this is I take my example data that I have here. I can group it on, say, levels of a factor variable. And then this is something I haven't shown you how to do before. But I say here, do tidy my linear model. What this says is pipe my data to this linear model here, run the linear model, but it's grouped. So it runs it once for each level of this factor variable. Then it tidies the output. So what do does is do is basically a dplyr way of running a grouped operation where it has to run some function on the inside. This is one way of doing this. Another way would be to do it with the per package, which I don't teach in this class, but it's roughly equivalent to doing a loop that loops over sort of subsets of the data or something like that. So it takes all this and then outputs the result um, as a single data frame. So what this is is this is the results of a model run on group A of factor one. This is the results run on group B of factor one and the results for group C of factor one. So by grouping on factor one, I've run four entire models, but because I've done this with tidy, it doesn't pop out as some garbage list that's hard to deal with. I get one big data frame and then I could do all sorts of operations with it using the standard dplyr tidy r syntax we've been working with so far in this class. I might wanna do something like plot these uh, different estimates and standard errors as like dot plots with confidence intervals on like a single plot so I could compare how these models fit within subgroups, a common operation a journal reviewers might ask you for. This kind of stuff is really handy and saves you the time of repeatedly running lots of models, stitching down their list to get output together and stuff like that. The other power of Broom is sort of a secret power of Broom in that Broom sits underneath the hood of a bunch of packages I'm gonna show you here in a minute. That is all the packages that convert model output into pretty tables. Almost all of them use Broom under the hood except Stargazer, which is a package I generally don't re recommend people use for a variety of reasons. Okay, so do we have any questions on that? I gotta keep chugging along, sorry for the fast pace, but this idiot made 78 slides, so, okay. Plotting model results. Okay, so sometimes you want to visualize the results from your models because tables by and large are not useful to almost anyone. So this is one of those things where if you write a journal article, everyone makes you include the table in it because some people like to read them and diagnose things and stuff. But 90% of the time, people would much prefer a picture to show them what's going on in something. The table, you might wanna look it up and be like, okay, I wanna make sure nothing is like, fishy in here, but the real results like visually communicated to people are usually the best way to provide something, right? And almost every statistics class you're going to take, aside from a couple ones that I know like well that do a good job of this, like MLE and things like that, you don't learn how to plot your model results very effectively. They just assume people are going to be happy with a table full of numbers. Some people are, those people are wrong. You should use pretty pictures. Anyway, for fitting nice models, I have used in the past the geom smooth argument to ggplots, right? So what geomsmooth does is it generates smoothed conditional means. So low S curves are a smooth conditional mean. The default geomsmooth is either a low S curve or for large data, something referred to as a generalized additive model, which you'd learn in Chris Ados visualizing data class. It's basically a spline like the low S curve. The thing is though, is that most regression models we use aside from like quantile regression are, quant are conditional mean models, right? Things like ordinary least squares, generalized linear models are fitting a model on what is the conditional mean, like for some X variable, what is the mean at that level of it, right? Well, GM smooth is for fitting conditional means. So it works for drawing these models on your graphs too. So we can use GM smooth to add layers that depict bivariate models. Almost all common bivariate models can be fit with GM smooth. So I can huck up the uh, Gapminder data here and show you. So by default, if I take a ggplot of the Gapminder data where X is year, Y is life expectancy, and color is continent, I can say geom point, jitter a little bit so you can see the actual dots. And then by default, I can just say geom smooth, and it fits here either a low S or a GAM model. There's probably enough observations here. It may have fit a GAM model, but I'm not sure. 
So these models just fit a smooth spline through all the data. It can kind of arbitrarily curve, but it can only curve so sharp, right? It's still a flexible line. I can change this, R, this uh, function here from geomsmooth to geomsmooth method equals either LM or GLM, and I can specify the formula if I want, and now the smooth line that runs through the data is a standard linear model line, right? This is just a y equals bx plus a, so an intercept plus some beta term on this model. It's a standard linear model. If I want to know what the bivariate relationship looks like between the year and life expectancy within the subgroups of continent, this is that linear model depicted on the data, right? The thing is, is I could fit other types of models here too. I could say method equals GLM, and then I could say family equals binomial, link equals logit, and I could fit a logit model in here if the data I've provided are binary data, right? Any of these GLM models you might see in your stats classes, Poisson models, all that kind of junk, you can fit them inside of GeomSmooth if you want. Okay. So here's a polynomial model. I could swap my formula in here from y tilde x to y polynomial x squared. This is basically me just being having x plus x squared, right? This is now a, uh, what do you call it? A quadratic model of year on life expectancy, right? So this is formula right here is exactly the sort of formula you would give inside your GLM or your LM, all those sort of shenanigans you can do. But the thing is, is you can only do it with two variables, your dependent variable and your independent variable here. If you want to add another variable, you can't do it because your plot only has an x-axis and a y-axis and it doesn't cut into some third dimension we can condition on, right? Okay, so if we want something more complex than a bivariate model, we need to do something other than geomsmooth. So if we have something that's complex, like say some nice nonlinear probability model, multi-level models, we also can't do most of those in uh, ggplot very well, right? So if we want to stick on covariates, which are probably most of the models you're going to fit in, say, papers and things like that, you're going to need to move outside of this geom smooth paradigm, right? So before I get into how to do that, I want to go over just a little bit of vocab on this that's important to know, and if you're not familiar with it, will help you probably better think what's going on in some R packages and in some papers and things. If you really want to get into this, I could throw you whole books on this topic. You're going to get one slide on vocab. Okay. <clears throat> So the idea is that we're often interested in what might happen if some variables took specific values, often specific combinations that aren't actually seen in the data, right? We want to know what would it look like if x was equal to 5 and z was equal to 2, right? What is this predicted outcome? So when you set variables to certain values, like hypothetical values, we will usually in the literature refer to them as counterfactual values or just counterfactuals, right? So we want to know what outcome would we see given some set of counterfactual values, okay? So maybe if we know nothing about an observation, our prediction for that estimate might be just based on assuming every variable is at its mean. So you might be like, let's predict things. Let's see what it would look like if every single variable in our data was just at its average value. That is a set of counterfactuals. It's like, what would it be if it's average on everything? It might very well be the case. If you have some sort of variables that are like negatively correlated in your data, there might be no observations where everything is at the mean or even close to the mean. But we might want to know what that would look like. It's a type of counterfactual. Sometimes, though, we might have some specific questions which require setting many many combinations of variables to particular values and then making estimates or predictions, right? If you remember back to the ggplot lecture, at the very end of it, I showed you a plot of counterfactual values. That was the probability of being arrested in different types of neighborhoods for different types of crimes if the person the police are being called on is a black or white person and the person who is calling the police is a black or white person. All those are counterfactual values, and every dot on that plot represented a different counterfactual scenario, 
right? These counterfactuals often are sort of important ideas. It's like in this ideal type situation, like how likely is it if you're going to be arrested, if you're black, a white person is calling the police on you, you're in a white neighborhood and it was a nuisance crime. That is for something like loitering. Answer sometimes really high, right? That's an answer people want to know about, but it actually requires a lot of math to come up with it. <clears throat> so Providing specific estimates conditional on values of covariates is a really nice way in general to summarize results for your models, particularly if they have unintuitive parameters, okay? So if you hear from someone that they know how to intuitively interpret the results from a logit model, most of the time that person does not know what they're talking about and you should not listen to them. So if somebody says they can directly interpret log odds, I've only met one person who, who directly interpreted log odds correctly, and they were an economist, which means they were secretly a robot. Um, and the, if people say they can interpret odds ratios correctly, they are usually also wrong. If somebody says something like an odds ratio of two means something's twice as likely to occur, do not listen to that person. They are very nonlinear and conditional on the values of every other variable. Odds ratios are weird. Okay, so don't trust people. Don't use odds ratios. Don't use log odds. Plot everything and it will make a lot more sense. Work in probabilities. Okay, so there is a package that makes doing all of this very, very easy. This package is called GG Effects. <clears throat> So if you want to look at these more complex models and you want to make nice predicted values for them with confidence intervals and things, we can use GG effects to create and plot tidy marginal effects. That is tidy data frames of ranges of predicted values that you can then feed straight into ggplot for plotting them, okay? There's two main functions in GG effects. There is GG predict, which computes those predicted values for your outcome variable at the margins of specific variables. And then there is a plot method for this called plot.ggfx. This just means if you take the result of a ggpredict object and then run plot on it, it makes a ggplot instead of a base R plot. This makes it easy to do pipe chains where you run a model, send it to ggpredict, and then send it to plot, and you get a nice ggplot out on the other side, okay? Oh, so here's a great one. That validates me being confused in my Economist taught stat class on logits and odds. Yes, odds are weird. Unless you spend a lot of time at the track or playing poker, odds don't make much sense. So yeah, they're their own thing. If you do though, I've had some students who are like played mad poker and stuff and odds were totally sensible to them. And it's like, oh yeah, I can convert that to probability in my head. I'm like, what the hell? You should gamble less. But anyway, so. Uh, to show off GG effects, um, I just simulate some quick data. So usually when I have a slide on simulating data, I just put it here in case you want to see how it was done. I'm not going to dwell on it. The gist of it is I just needed some data with a mix of categorical and continuous relationships that were known and strong so these plots look nice. That's all this is. Okay. So when you run a model and then give it to GG predict, what it will do is produce a data frame with one row for every unique value of a supplied predictor or set of predictors, okay? So each row will then contain an expected or estimated value for the outcome variable plus nice confidence intervals. So an example of how that works is I take my linear model I ran earlier and I just say y on, this is a numeric variable and a factor variable using my data. Then I say, gg predict my model object, the terms equals here num1. What this is going to do is it's going to provide expected values of y conditional on numeric variable 1 while holding factor 1 constant at its reference level because it's a factor variable. If it was a continuous variable, it would hold it at its mean. So it automatically knows how to condition and handle these things. Okay? So, the output of that, these estimated values, looks something like this. It's going to say, these are predicted values of y. x is, the x here is my num1 variable. These are the different values of x it's selected. For a continuous variable, it picks pretty breaks. So this variable runs from approximately negative 8 to 6. So it broke them at intervals of 2 as integers. This is a predicted value of y. So this is what y would be if x is negative 8, 
holding constant the factor one variable at A. <clears throat> so this raw tabular output from it tells you everything it's doing. It also shows you, this is the standard error of the estimate, and this is the 95% confidence interval for the prediction at that level of X. So this is everything you sort of need to know about these predictions um, to use them in a tabular form, okay? This table though, doesn't look necessarily like something that you could just work with like a data frame. It turns out it actually is. It just has a special print method to make it look pretty. The cool thing about this is we don't have to work with this table at all. If I just put it into plot and I say plot those estimated values, it makes a nice predicted value plot. So it converts those values. So the value of num1 at negative eight had a predicted value of what like negative 2.3-ish, so negative 2.22. That's that value right there. The confidence interval back here from negative 4.19 to negative 0.25 is this confidence interval right here. So it takes all that tabular data, the predicted values generated, and immediately converts it into a nice legible plot. You look at this and you know what the expected value of y is at all of these different values of numeric one. You can see if they're statistically significant at those different levels, right? This is a very simple model, a standard linear model, but GGFX will work with almost any type of model. It also works with a, lot, a wide range of Bayesian models, hierarchical models, some structural equations and things like that. It works with just about everything, kind of like Broom does, right? So, for instance, I could run a logit model. So here I say, let's run a logit model where my binary Y is being predicted. Notice I'm predicting here by four different variables. It doesn't matter how many variables I put in the model. Anything I don't tell it to use in my terms, it's gonna hold constant at either its mean or its reference level, depending on what it is. But you can also tell it what to condition on if you wanna be picky. And notice how I did this. I didn't even save my model object. I didn't save my ggpredict output. I did it all in one pipe. I said, run my model here, which is a logit model, pipe it into ggpredict. I want, and notice I do multiple terms. I say, I want my marginal values, my predicted values for my numeric one variable and my factor one variable, and then I pipe it straight into plot. Look what ggpredict does. It gives me the numeric variable, the first one mentioned running across the x-axis, and then it does groups and colors on the second variable I provide. So you can give it multiple variables and it will show predicted values across multiple ones. So the second variable here gets turned into the color or grouping term. I could give it a third group and I could facet on it if I want. I think the maximum ggpredict supports is three variables, but I'm not positive. Okay, so to make it a faceted plot instead, all you have to do is in that plot function say facet equals true, and now this FAC1 variable, now its levels get split onto three different facets of the plot. So it plays nice with sort of the ggplot logic of making these things easy to visualize. So ggpredict takes out most of the difficulty in getting these sort of predicted values and then allows you to do nice ggplot things with it. And another cool thing is because this is ggplot based and not base R, I could say plus theme minimal, plus scale color or whatever, and tack things onto it and do all the stuff we've been doing with ggplot all term, right? Really powerful, really intuitive, okay? Uh, so this is the question here. Kelsey asks, if you do see num1, fact1, fact2, will it automatically facet on fact2? I believe yes, because it doesn't have a nice way to group two different variables on one. I believe it automatically facets the third one. I'd have to test it. This package has been in development a lot, and I haven't been using it a lot in the last year, um, mainly because I've had some models that were too complicated for it, and so I haven't been doing it manually. I'm also a nerd, and I kind of like doing these things manually. Um, but I think this package, this package um, has like revolutionized my teaching of this material to my grad students and also to like undergrads who come into Caesar for help. I'm like, ah, don't do whatever you're doing. Just do it in GGFX. It's amazing what it can do. I think it does automatically facet though. Okay. So you can also set specific values for those variables that you use as terms. So if I take the same GLM model I ran before, I send it to ggpredict, I can say terms num1 and then in brackets say 
I want you to have num1 running from negative 1 to 0 to 1. And then it will do those, the plot across negative 1, 0, and 1 on that variable. And then factor on levels A and B. So you'll see now it's only faceted on A and B. It dropped C because I didn't ask for it on the factor. And then on both cases, it runs from negative 1 to 0 to 1. So you can even set specific values here if you want. Yeah. So it has some flexibility. Don't just aren't just stuck with the things that it is by default. Next, you can also do representative values. So rather than selecting specific values, you can say, I want my values predicted at the mean and plus and minus one standard deviation or at just the minimum and maximum. Right. So as it turns out for the numeric two variable, its minimum was negative 9.22 and its maximum was 8.15. Because I said facet, it puts the minimum here, the maximum here, and then the x variable runs from its mean, from its minus one standard deviation, which is about here, to plus one standard deviation, and then its mean is sitting right here. So you can also do representative values. If you look in the documentation, and this is one of the great things about GGFX, it has terrific online documentation. If you look in the documentation, you can do a lot of cool and interesting things. And I think this is a way better solution for visualizing marginal effects than basically anything out there. So it'll do most of the things if you're familiar with Stata that like margins commands and things will do, except it's a lot easier to use. Okay? There's only a small class of things it cannot do easily, which are first differences. So if you'd like to know, for instance, what is the difference between plus one and minus one standard deviation and get a confidence interval on it, it doesn't do that easily. That's the thing I do all the time, so it's annoying to me. But if you're interested in how to do that, I do it all the time and I'll send you a code. Okay. Uh, so yeah. Oh, Anna, Anna here says, I've used SJPLOT for plotting predicted values. Do you know if this is similar related to GGFX? SJPLOT is, or sorry, GGFX is written by the author of SJPLOT and the code is the same underneath the hood. So SJPLOT, I actually used to have about six or seven slides on SJPLOT in this lecture. Um, yeah, it's the same author and his stuff is really good. So the stuff you do in SJPLOT is the same stuff that's in GGFX. Um, I just teach this GGFX, it's quite specific to this, but everything you can do in GGFX, you can do in SJPLOT, because it's the same author. Okay. okay, and actually I still have the SJPLOT lecture material, it's just after the last slide of this one if you're interested in that stuff too. Though if you've used it, you probably know as much as me. Next thing is that ggpredict does not only do plots of sort of continuous data and line plots. If you give it as a first term, a factor variable, a categorical variable, it automatically does dot plots with error bars instead. So it understands the type of data you're giving it and does what are normally the appropriate types of plot. So instead of doing like a continuous line plot here, it says, oh, okay, let's just plot values of factor one on the x-axis and then factor two grouped, but because they're categorical, it doesn't make sense to draw a line through them. So instead do nice dot plots with confidence intervals, okay? So it handles categorical data, continuous data, multiple variables simultaneously, conditions on the omitted variables. And I don't show it here, um, but you can also condition and say, I wanna hold every other variable at something like it's minimum, every other variable at specific values, all that. You can do all that too, it's quite flexible. Okay. <clears throat> So some notes on GGFX, uh, it's a big package that does a lot of cool stuff. And like I said before, it has great documentation. So if you want to know how to do something with it, I highly recommend looking at its vignettes, look at the GitHub repository and stuff like that. Uh, the author is also really active on like Stack Overflow and Twitter and stuff. I actually did a tutorial on GGFX. This guy must like Google himself continuously. He found it on Twitter and like gave me a thumbs up and chatted with me a bit. He's really good. Okay. Um, so it also does other things like um, you can do predicted values for polynomial models. It also, and this is an important one, it does interaction terms. So it's really hard to visualize interactions between variables normally. GGFX sort of just does them right off the bat, super easy, makes this very nice. Um, it works with lots and lots of packages. Most common packages are supported by GGFX. Sometimes I'll be doing some stats and something not supported by GGFX. It's kind of a bummer, but they are out there. Um, yeah. Uh, and of course, because it is ggplot based, all the stuff we've learned about ggplot, we can use to modify those. If you want to do something more complicated than what's supported by ggfx, 
I do have some slides here on what I call advanced counterfactuals, which shows you how to do these calculations manually using the actual math and simulated distributions. This is what's done in uh, like Chris Adolph's maximum likelihood class, except my code is like one tenth as much code to do the same job. Um, and you can do things like that complicated plot I showed before, which was this probability of arrest plot for Seattle Police Department data. Right. So the thing about this, I couldn't do it in GGFX because this was a four way interaction model and GGFX, I couldn't do all of them simultaneously. So if you need to do something really complex like this, you can do the math manually. Um, but it is complicated. So I removed it from the lecture because I don't like blowing up people's brains in week 10. Okay. <clears throat> so chugging along here. Uh, do we have any questions about the GGFX stuff before I hop on to making tables? Chugging along, just cram all the fun stuff into week 10. Okay, keep moving, making tables. So up until now, I have largely punished you with pander for making tables in our markdown documents. So pander is a really simple package for doing really basic tables. It's very inflexible, but it sort of just works. I like it as an initial example to people because it's sort of like, normally it's kind of hard to break Panda. It doesn't have enough options to really mess it up, but it's not the sort of thing you're gonna use outside of like a memo or a basic website or something. I wouldn't even use it most in my basic websites because I don't think they're that attractive. But Pander can do regression tables, right? So if I run a linear model and then put it into Pander, it will do a nice markdown table like this. It will take that output and make each row a parameter. The columns will be statistics. Like this is a standard linear model, so it gives me the estimate, the standard error, the T value, and the P value. This, is, this table right here is pulled directly from the summary of the linear model. So basically runs summary on linear model and then pulls out the coefficient table. It adds one little caption down here saying I'm fitting a model of MPG on weight and horsepower, which was my example model, okay? It's pretty basic. If you run pander on summary of a model, it does the same table, but then gives you the number of observations, residual standard error, R squared and adjusted R squared, or whatever relevant fit statistics for the type of model you give it. It's still pretty bare bones. It's the kind of thing I'm happy to have in slides like this or something, but I'm not gonna be putting in a nice presentation. I'm not gonna be putting in a memo. I'm sure I'm not gonna put in a paper or something like that, but it's fast and it works, okay? But it's quite basic. So if you're doing something other than basic R markdown documents, like the homeworks in my class, you're going to want to work with something other than Pander. So today I'm going to talk about basically three different packages and approaches for making nicer tables. There are a million packages for doing nice tables in R. I'm going to talk about these because these are sort of very modern approaches, which are getting quite feature rich. Um, and have a lot of collaborators, they're not gonna die, and I think the syntax is nice. So the main one I'm gonna talk about here is the GT package, which is like the great tables package. This is a package made by our studio. So it is a sort of a tidyverse oriented package with a million developers and they actually have money behind it. Packages with money behind them tend to develop really quickly and are able to do really nice stuff. This is a package for general table construction. Any type of table can be built with GT as long as it's based on a data frame, makes it very powerful. I'm then going to talk about model summary, which is mainly for creating nice tables from models. It's partially based on GT. And then the GT summary package, which I mostly use for creating data summaries. You can make model tables with it, but I don't like its syntax for that that much. Um, it's also based partially on GT, but unlike its name suggests, it's also not completely GT, which I'll show you in a bit has some advantages. So the GT package, if you need more customizability or especially different output types than something like Pander can do, I recommend the GT package. This link here goes to the official GT website, which is all spiffy because it's an RStudio website. So GT is a really powerful and also very new system for creating tables out of data frames. So like everything else is kind of tidyverse, ori tidyverse oriented, it's all about data frames and GT is all about data frames. Okay, so to do some examples of the GT package, um, I somehow, after years of working with dplyr, only realized 
last week that it has a built-in Star Wars data frame. So I basically ruined my life and wasting my life up until this point and not using these data. So I'm going to finally make use of the Star Wars data for an example. So this is a little bit of quick data cleaning. I'm not gonna discuss because it uses some complex functions here. The gist of it is what I wanted was to grab some Star Wars characters only from episode five um, and then there was a mistake on Obi-Wan Kenobi's starship in episode five, so I fixed that to give him no ship. So anyway, we're gonna work with some Star Wars data for this table. If I glimpse at these Empire Strikes Back characters, you'll see it's a data frame that has the columns, name of the character, the species of the character, what starships they're associated with, which could be multiple starships, but I reduced it to only one for the Empire Strikes Back, then their mass and their height, some vital statistics, okay. So GT, the function GT in the GT package will initialize a table and render it as a data frame using markdown. So if I just say, take this data frame TES characters and pipe it into GT, I will get a markdown version of my data frame that looks like this, right? It's a simple but reasonably nice looking data frame, right? The column names are set off with some uh, horizontal bars. Um, it looks kind of nice, you know, it's nothing special, it kind of looks like general data frame output, like the viewer or something in our studio, okay? Um, yeah, so you initialize with GT. The thing is though, is GT plays nice with functions that occur before it. For instance, if I say I want to group my data by starships and then pipe it into GT, the table reacts to the grouping of the data by dplyr and groups the table by what I group by. So now you'll see, Instead of X-Wing, that is a starship, in the starship column, the starship column is turned into a way of grouping the table. There are now subtables. These are the characters associated with X-Wings, with no ship, with the TIE Advance, the Millennium Falcon, and Boba Fett's ship slave one down here, right? So these are all broken into subtables. This is nice because this is actually a common operation you might want to do. Maybe you have a broomed up nice table of all of your different variables in your data frame. You could add a new variable that categorizes them by the type of variable they are. Maybe some are demographic variables, individual variables, different levels. You could group on that pipe into GT. Your individual level variables would be in one block, your, your context variables in another block. This makes it really easy to have tables broken up in different ways, okay? So it reacts to it, it plays nice with dplyr. So, I could then do something like say GT row name column equals name. This says the name column in my data is not a measure I want shown in my column. It's just something for organizing my data. What this does is it removes, as you'll see, the name column at the top, the name disappears. And instead it sets off all of the things in the name column by a little divider. This is good for, say, separating the terms that you're working with, the names of variables from their estimates and their standard errors and stuff on the other side, right? Or in this case, just organizing and setting off that all of these are names of characters and all the things on the right side are attributes of those characters. It sort of suggests this by looking at it, right? So this is a nice thing to be able to do. The thing with GT, though, is with GT, you don't keep adding arguments inside the GT call. Instead, it works like dplyr. You keep adding things on until you get the table you want. So here, what I say is, take my GT table and then add a header to it. My header is going to be title, Star Wars characters, subtitle, The Empire Strikes Back. It adds a header up here at the top. So you'll see the rest of the table stayed the same, but it adds a nice header with the title and stuff I say. So GT uses an additive syntax. This is nicer than dumping a whole bunch of arguments into a single function like that, where you might have errors and things, things might crop up. Instead, you just tack little bits on, because it means you could then take that code you used to tack something on and put it on another table or something like that, okay? So I could then add a spanner to it. Let's say I have a couple measures of columns in my data, and I want to group them together to suggest they're linked together in some way. Maybe I have something like on the right side, fit statistics or something associated with it. Maybe I have like a lower bound and an upper bound of a confidence interval. I can say here, for instance, tab spanner, the label is vitals, and I want my spanner to cover the mass and height columns. 
So now the mass column and the height column has a vitals label over the top and a little bar that sets it aside. This is a way to set off sort of things that go together. Like I want people to know these are vital statistics, but they are not something linked over here to my species column, right? This is a nice way to break things up a little bit. You can just add a spanner, okay? Next thing I tag on, we can change the column labels. If we don't want to change the actual names of the columns and the data or something, I can actually change them in GT. So this says here, I want to change the labels of some of my columns. I want to change the mass column to be mass in kilograms, height to be height in centimeters, and species just to be capitalized species. So the labels up here at the top for the columns go from being my ugly original variable names to being my fixed up ones. Okay. This is kind of nice because within the table here, it will show and display them like this, but in functions afterwards, I can still use their original variable names. I don't have to use these modified ones. It only changes the label, not the actual data. So you can keep working exactly as you have been up to this point. Okay. Then I can also do things like modify the format of data in the cells. So you'll notice here, every single person's mass in this table ends with dot zero, except for Boba Fett, because apparently they needed that extra little bit of precision for the bounty hunter's weight, okay? So maybe I don't want that because it just clogs up my table for no reason. I don't need to know he's 0.2 kilograms above 78. So what I say here is add a format number target my mass variable. So this says, what columns do I want to format? The variables I want to target are the mass column, but I could format other ones this way if I wanted to too. I could be like mass, comma, height, comma, species, do them all that way. And then I just say decimal zero, and it chops off the decimal places. This formatting can do a lot more. Maybe I want to say format it like money, and it would format it and put a cents place and a dollar sign in front, right? It can do a lot of special formatting like that, okay? It's quite powerful. Next, I say align my columns. I don't like that species is left aligned and mass is right aligned for some arbitrary reason. I say, let's make all of these columns of data over here center aligned. So I say, columns align, align them to be center. Which columns? I want the variables, species, mass, and height to be center aligned. So now this is center aligned, this is center aligned, this is center aligned, but it left alone my left column, okay? So you can mess with alignments and things. Now, as some of you probably know from asking me email questions, you're probably aware you can't modify alignments of columns in a pander table. The reason for that is Markdown doesn't support alignment of text at all. It's not a thing you can do in Markdown. So one of the powerful things about GT is this table is not even being rendered as Markdown in here. This table over here is an HTML table. In this case, I'm rendering it to an image in the background and displaying it, but it can render in formats that support additional formatting which also allows you to do all sorts of crazy things like change fonts, embed images, weird stuff like that. You can do it all in GT, things you cannot do in a pander table, okay? The last thing I do here is you can also modify the group orders. So in this case, I have X-Wing listed, then no ship, TIE Advance, Millennium Falcon, Slave One. Maybe what I actually want is I want to go X-Wing and then Millennium Falcon and I don't care about the rest. I say here, change my row group order. My groups, I say X-Wing and Millennium Falcon. It interprets this to mean I want this one first, this one second, and then the other ones just in the order they existed in before. I don't have to name them all. It just puts them in their existing order after the ones I've named. So I can swap my groups around. Again, this is useful for something like ordering a bunch of variable groups in a model. Maybe you have some control variables you want down at the bottom, but you want maybe your key individual and context variables up at top, put them up at the top, let everything else sit on the bottom. You can rearrange it to your heart's content. So I use this GT package to make the pretty tables in my articles and memos because it's really flexible and it does a lot of cool stuff. Okay. So this was the original table on the left. This is the new table on the right. 
right? So beginning with this original data frame, we can dress it up quite a bit with a few little GT commands. So GT is very flexible and very powerful. It worked kind of nicely off of that rough GT command, but you can dress it up in all sorts of ways, ways most table packages do not let you work. Right, Stargazer has a very particular way it likes its tables to look. You can add or remove certain things, rearrange a little bit, but it's pretty rigid. GT is like, put stuff where you want, do whatever you want. All I care about is it was originally in a data frame. Okay, super nice. Okay, so the thing is though, GT is a really new package. And right now they are pr prioritizing their markdown and HTML output because it's really hard to produce PDF output nicely because PDF output requires LaTeX, right? So right now GT is a little finicky when you use it in PDF documents. It generally works for me, but sometimes it gets upset about some things and needs some troubleshooting. For tables that you need in LaTeX and you need to be stable and effective, I recommend right now looking into either the Cable Extra or Stargazer packages. I don't particularly like Stargazer, but if you're working with common models supported by it, it does good looking tables and they come out nicely in LaTeX. The reason they come out nicely in LaTeX is Stargazer is written by an economist. That's why its syntax is garbage, but its tables are pretty in LaTeX because economists tend to do everything in LaTeX to begin with because it's this really weird hurdle that they sort of expect people to jump over in the profession. They don't like, we don't take you seriously unless you learn an arcane garbage text formatting language unrelated to your discipline. That is a hoop we were gonna make you jump over to be taken seriously in your discipline. I learned LaTeX anyway, I don't recommend doing it. But anyway, Cable Extra can also do that, and in fact makes tables that look just as nice as Stargazer, but its syntax looks like GT. And I actually think the reason for that is the Cable Extra developers are now on GT. Anyway, like GT, Cable Extra let, allows you to construct complex tables in either HTML or LaTeX using an additive syntax that looks like ggplot or dplyr. Stargazer just makes nicely formatted tables in sort of a fixed format. It's a little bit idiosyncratic and it doesn't support some models. Models that an economist would not be interested in using are not supported by Stargazer. So common like machine learning stuff, a lot of Bayesian stuff isn't well supported. Uh, also Stargazer, and this is blasphemous to me, doesn't have a GitHub page. So if you wanna fix bugs, you have to email them to the author. That is just ridiculous. Anyway, so if you wanna edit LaTeX documents yourself, so if you do need to work in LaTeX, maybe you gotta tune up a table and you can't find a way to do it, you can write LaTeX documents and edit them in R using .rnw files. These are SWE files. As I've said before, I highly recommend not going down this rabbit hole. It's a bad idea. LaTeX will destroy your life. And if you do want to work like with LaTeX, I actually recommend not doing it in RStudio, but instead using Overleaf, which is an online, what you see is what you get LaTeX editor. It's a little bit better platform for people who are new to LaTeX. I do most of my LaTeX in our studio, but I've been doing it a long time. I've traumatized myself with it, so I don't recommend other people do it. Uh, lastly though, most things you wanna do in LaTeX are actually already supported in our markdown rather than sweep files. So you can actually insert a table in LaTeX directly into a markdown document and it will render it properly. So by and large, the things you wanna do will render in our markdown document anyway. So please just don't do LaTeX, stay away from it. Any questions about that side of tables? I'm gonna get into model tables here next. Huff down some more coffee. Then start talking even faster. Okay. So the model summary package. So the model summary package is a neat package which combines Broom with the GT and Cable Extra packages to take just about any model you might fit in R and convert it into a pretty table. So it lets Broom do the hard work of converting the model into a data frame, and then it lets Cable Extra and GT do the work of producing a nice model table, right? So this is what I call like good software development. Don't be like Stargazer, which has to figure out how to digest a model itself and then make a nice table. Instead, find packages that do these jobs well already and become an interface between them, okay? So model summary takes care of this for you. 
So a nice thing about model summary though, is because it uses both GT and Cable Extra, it can produce really nice looking output in HTML documents, markdown documents, LaTeX, raw text documents, Word documents and images, right? So it can even produce PNG and JPEG images of your tables. It does all these things, it's happy to do whatever you want, right? It only has one key function in it. So you load up the model summary package and then you can either call on M summary or model summary. They do the same thing. It summarizes your models. Then if you don't like the way it looks by default, you can add on to M summary, M summary output using either GT or Cable Extra to dress them up, okay? So it works like this. If I run a linear model like this and I give it to model summary, by default, it's gonna generate a table that looks something like this. So this was a basic model with a dependent variable, one independent variable. It displays the intercept with the standard error, my independent variable with its estimate and standard error, and then it gives me observations and R squared, adjusted R squared, AIC, BIC, and log likelihood for the model, right? So kind of standard fit statistics, standard display up here. You'll notice here, it actually looks fairly like a pander table, and it's because this table is rendered in Markdown the same way that Pander is. If I don't change the output, it displays it in Markdown, so it kind of is basic and looks like a Pander table, okay? The thing about it, though, is you can do some fancy stuff. So unlike Pander, I can give model summary a list of multiple models, and it will make a table of multiple models. So here I ran three different linear models. And then I said, I'm gonna make a list of models. It does need to be a named list for model summary. I say model one is mod one, model two is mod two, model three is mod three. Model summary of this list, and it puts model one first, model two second, model three third, arranges the uh, um, variables here, kind of in nice rows. And this allows me to produce um, the common, often very bad journal format where somebody starts with some basic model that has like one variable in it that no human being would ever think is an accurate model of anything, and then slowly adds variables to show how smart they are controlling for things until they arrive at their beautiful model, the truth at the end, that is their complex and correct model of the world, right? It's really just a waste of table space because no one believes the simple model accurately captures anything, but sometimes the, that's what people want, okay? So you can reproduce those bad tables and model summary like this. You can say this is model one, two, and three. A better use of this would be to provide like a set of models which are in some way mutually exclusive, or there's some models that are fundamentally limited, like you, one model is a fixed effects model, the other is a random effects model, that sort of thing where they make different assumptions, but they have different strengths. That is a better use of it. Okay. Uh, yeah, anyway, but you can do that in model summary. You just give it as many models as you want, right? And you can also do it with different types of model. So if I did a linear model here, a GLM model here, and maybe a like hierarchical model, I could put them all next to each other. And the ones that have the same name coefficients end up in the same rows, but the additional stuff for those other special models gets added on as different rows, right? So it's very powerful, very flexible. Another nice thing about model summary, like I said, is it gives lots of different types of output. So if I say model summary of that model list, output equals LaTeX, it will instead of rendering through Markdown, it will use Cable Extra to generate PDF output, which would look something like this. This is a nice PDF looking table that kind of looks closer to like a stargazer table in a PDF, right? All I had to do is say output LaTeX, it generates that nice looking table, right? Really quite good. One second. Oh yeah, some of the urban design and planning related folks have to go for something. I will be sad to miss you all. Okay. Anyway, um, yeah, so you can do PDF output like this, makes nice looking tables. For customizing these tables using like Cable Extra, so this LaTeX table needs to be customized with Cable Extra, I recommend going on their documentation. It's got really good documentation. It has a, a lot of options because basically anything you can do with Cable Extra or GT can be done to these tables. It's a whole world of things, right? Okay. Uh, you can also save model summaries as uh, objects to your like computer. So for instance, if I say M summary model list output equals this table.png, it will automatically save it as a PNG image file that looks like this right to my disk in my working directory. If I said 
I think it will even save as a PDF. If I say PDF, it can save as a lot of different formats. Okay, so it can dump it to files, it can dump it to whatever. Okay. Uh, so like I said, you can mix up model summary with the GT package to dress your tables up. If I say model summary, model list, output equals GT, I can then pipe on and add GT options to my table. So here I've taken the same table I generated earlier, but then I add tab header, table one linear model, subtitle DV miles per gallon, and I get that nice header up here. And now you'll kind of see it looks a little bit more like my GT tables from before, because technically speaking, I'm actually rendering this as an image because they don't look nice in my slides due to my own bad formatting. Yeah, um, like I said before, uh, if you're going to generate LaTeX output in PDFs, I recommend using Cable Extra or LaTeX output here instead of GT. GT will work, but you might have to massage it a little bit to make it look just right. Um, and also, like you might do something like render it one day and it looks perfect, and then the next day your LaTeX no longer works because they updated something in GT that broke LaTeX output because it's not a focus of development right now. LaTeX output breaks about every other update for a day or two. It just happens. This actually kind of screwed me on a, uh, a bias and policing report I did a while back where they updated GT and broke all the table generation functions and I needed to render it, but I couldn't revert the uh, version of it. Anyway, ended up doing my tables manually in LaTeX. Brain broken as a result. So don't do that. Okay. So the next package I want to talk about is GT summary. So GT summary is similar to model summary. What it does is it uses the broom package, GT, and Cable Extra to do flexible table making similar to it. The difference with GT summary, though, is that it doesn't just work with models. It also works with raw data frames to generate descriptive statistic tables, the type of tables you often will have in the data section or methods section of your paper before you start running and doing inferential work, right? So I present model summary for doing models and GT summary for these descriptive tables purely because I think model summary has better syntax for working with models. And then also because uh, the model summary package was originally named GT summary and the author of GT summary stole the name on CRAN. So I also think that that is an ethical thing to do. So I present model summary when I can. So GT summary is still a good package. I just think that's a shitty thing to do. Okay. So the base function that you'll want to use in GT summary is called table underscore summary. So by default, if you take a data frame, so here I took the MT cars data frame, data frame built into R, I grabbed only its first nine columns to make it fit on my slide, and I send it to table summary. So by default, what table summary does is it provides frequencies for categorical and binary variables. So cylinder, for instance, is a categorical variable. It's a factor with three levels. There are four, six, and eight. It shows them as the frequencies within that category. There's 11 observations of four cylinder cars. That's 34% of the data, right? For continuous variables, by default, it provides quantiles. This package was written by... Uh, um, people at a cancer research center. So their default idea of descriptive statistics is quantiles rather than like means and mean, means. So just know that they do that, you can swap it. By default, it presents them in the, in the value of the 50th percentile, that is the median, and the 25th and 75th percentiles of them. And it also presents the sample size uh, up here at the top, n equals 32. And it by default says what statistics are being presented. The median and the interquartile range, that's the name for the 25th and 75th percentiles, and then the frequency with percentages, okay? So this is sort of a nice quick default table. So something you could have in a memo or something, you could dress it up in a number of ways, but table summary just sort of gives you the basic raw summary stuff you're probably interested in. <clears throat> the thing about table summary, and that is the GT summary package, is you can also do things like stratify on a grouping variable. So unlike GT, where I just said group by and then pipe the data frame in, here I have to give an argument to table summary. I say, give me a table summary, but summarize it by the AM variable. The AM variable is the transmission of cars. So now I have one set of descriptives for AM0, that is in this data set, automatic transmission is zero. It's confusing. Automatic transmission vehicles here, and then manual transmission variables over here. 
Okay, so it just stratifies the table by some categorical variable. This is kind of cool because very often we want subsample descriptive statistics. Maybe what you're doing is you're trying to claim that you have like a control group and a treatment group and they're the same on everything except your treatment, right? That's the ideal. You just stratify your treatment variable. They've designed it specifically for this because they are biomedical researchers who need to do these tables and everything that they do to show that their control and treatment groups are generally balanced, right? So. The thing with table summary is because you can use it with GT, you can also dress it up with GT functions, which is why I'm teaching you the GT package. You can do lots of cool stuff with it. So here I've said the MT cars data set, select these variables, I stratify the table. The way that you get GT output with, with uh, the GT summary package is with a piped in function called as GT. This takes the output of table summary and converts it to that GT object. So instead of saying output GT, you say as GT. Everybody got to have a different syntax, right? But then I can say, okay, now it's a GT table. Let's add a title to it, or in this case, let's add a spanner to it, and then let's add a title to it. So the spanner I did here is I wanted to let people know that the zero and one variable in stratifying on is the type of transmission in the car. So I said, go over the stat columns. So you're like, what are the stat columns? The, the columns generated by table summary that store all the statistics all begin with stat underscore. This co column is stat underscore zero. This table is stat underscore one. It's just the syntax for it. But know that if I wanna make a spanner over the top of these two different subgroups, I could say span these two columns. Notice this syntax starts with stat. That's select syntax from dplyr. Everything in GT uses the dplyr syntax for everything. It's actually calling on dplyr functions to do it. I want to label transmission over those columns. There's now a nice transmission label over the top of the two columns I've uh, spanned. And then tab header, motor trend cars, descriptive statistics, adds motor trend cars and descriptive statistics. So I've used the stuff we learned back on that GT slides to add to one of these tables. So all the stuff, well, it is like changing constantly and it's kind of annoying to learn something that's changing. As you can see, it can all work together. So we could eventually end up only having to learn one system to make tables in anything. And that'll make your life a lot easier than learning how to make a different table for every damn stats package you work with, right? So this is something I've just new added to these lectures here, but I think it's really great. And hopefully this is the way reality works in the R world going forward is it all plays nice with one uniform package. Okay. Uh, one bonus I want to tack on here at the end. Uh, so first though, does anybody have any questions about these tables, general stuff, either the specific syntax or general ideas? I have a question. Um, this might be uh, out of bounds for like this particular talk, but I have been trying to deal with check all that apply data. Um, and I've been using the GT summary and it does not like check all that apply data. So I've been like playing with like long wide formats and I can generate like individual tables that are correct, but I can't put them, I can't put like variables together. Yeah, so um, the thing that you need to think about for that particular thing is um, how exactly you want it to be displayed. So this is really a case where check all that apply um, check all that apply things are sort of unique because technically no check all that apply question is ever a single variable. You can think about it as a series of dummy variables is really what it is. But what it's a series is, is a series of dummy variables you want grouped nicely in your table. So you want it to be intuitive, but you need to remember under the hood, it is multiple variables. So really what it's about is figuring out how to modify the table. So those things look like they're one variable, but they're really dummy variables because it's like, you know, each one of them is, is separate. They're only grouped because sort of mentally and conceptually you've grouped them together into one question. But it's really, if you've got five check all the replies, it's five questions. So the question is, how do you display them in a data frame and then take that data frame and put it into a table and have it nicely displayed, right? So the way to do that, you know, the question is sort of how you want to display it in the table. If you can sketch out like the way you want it displayed in a table, you can either figure out how to make it display by messing with it in GT, or you could sketch it out, take a picture of it and send it to me and I'll tell you how you can make a display nice in a GT table. 
So uh, if you let me know, but it's kind of an unusual type of data, but it, think about how you'd need to use it in a statistical model. The only way you could use a check all that apply questions in a statistical model is either to have it each individual dummy variables or do a sum of them. And a sum would make a very strong uh, assumption about measurement that all of those different ones have an exactly equal effect and are totally interchangeable, which is highly unrealistic for, you know, just about any check all that apply question. Um, but yeah, so think about them like that. And if you have any trouble with it and you want help with it, feel free to email me. I'm totally happy to try to figure out how to make a display nice in a tape. I will, yeah, I'll email you. Thank you. Anything else? Cool beans, let us continue. <clears throat> okay, so I got one little bonus thing I stick in here. It's totally unrelated to anything else in this lecture, but it's really cool and I use it all the time. So I want people to know about it. There's a package called core plot. The core plot package does one thing and it does it really well. It is a package for displaying correlograms. That is a visual display of correlations between variables in a data set. So the way this thing works is you say, basically you just load up the package, you just give the core plot function a correlation matrix. So I took the MT cars data set, ran a correlation on it, and I give it to the core plot function. What does it do? it makes nice visualizations of correlations between variables. This is the kind of thing that I constantly give to my advisor. My advisor loves this thing. Every time I send him one of these, he's like, it's the fastest way to see uh, correlations between variables. It provides like the circles get bigger and like get deeper in color as the correlations get stronger. They're color coded for my blue to red here. And then in this case, I've displayed them as the correlations times 100. So this is a 0.85 negative correlation. You can have it sort by different like characteristics and groupings. You can give it clusters. So it just kind of displays everything. This is a great way that's way better than just showing a correlation table to get an idea of what's going on because you can it will draw you to patterns with variables really quickly, right? It'll let you show see that some variables are not strongly correlated to like anything in your data. Some really matter. Some have interesting positive and negative mixes and stuff like that. This is a function I use basically with every data set I ever encounter that has continuous variables. I huck them into core plot and often really important stuff is revealed to me that I even miss in the correlation tables themselves. So I'm a big fan of this, just wanted to advertise. It is base R based though, so you can't dress it up with uh, um, nice like uh, um, ggplot stuff, but it's not the kind of thing you put in a paper anyway by and large. So <clears throat> just nice to know about. Okay, so now because I've talked quickly, <clears throat> we have a remaining, you know, 35 minutes or so for me to angrily rant about reproducible research to all of you. So my time has finally come. You are subjected to this now. So <clears throat> reproducible research is something that's really important to me. I give presentations on it. I try and make all my, re my research like highly reproducible. I yell at people publicly for not making their research reproducible. And throughout this class, without me specifically saying it all the time, I've been teaching you a lot of reproducible research stuff. The biggest one being making you do everything in our markdown documents. All that stuff is by nature reproducible. If you press a button and it knits, it's gonna knit the next time you press that button too, probably, right? That's reproducible research, okay? <clears throat> so why reproducibility? Right. So reproducibility is not the same thing as replication. You may have heard like this, these ideas about the, the crises and replication in different disciplines, right? Reproducibility and replication are not the same thing. So replication is when you run a new study to show if and how results of a prior study hold. That is replicating the study, new data collection, things like that. You might run it the same way, but you're collecting new data. Reproducibility is simpler. This is about rerunning the same way you should get roughly the same result, right? That doesn't seem too unreasonable to me. That is what reproducibility is. You can get the same results if you do the exact same thing. Okay. So the thing is, is reproducible studies can still be wrong. And the thing about reproducibility is if you do a good job making something reproducible, it makes it way easier for people to prove that your study was wrong. So the incentives are sort of negative for making things reproducible. The more reproducible your stuff is, the easier it is for somebody to come along and be like, you did something wrong. 
but that's what makes it stronger for science, right? The ideal is that we want people to be able to find mistakes and not publish bad research. You know, we want in an ideal world, probably put out of business 90% of journals and most of the work published in even the really good journals, right? So anyway, reproducibility is simple. What it means is just transparent research practices, as transparent as possible, and then minimizing barriers to verifying your work, right? You want people to be able to see exactly what you did, and you want them to be able to go out and test and do it. It instills confidence if you make your work reproducible. So my mantra here is that any study that is not reproducible can be trusted only on faith. In the sciences, I do not like trusting anyone only on faith. I'm highly suspicious of people in general, you know, um, not you guys, you guys are great. But scientists, yeah, there's a lot of bad incentives and it's very easy, as we all know, to make mistakes, right? And if people are just like, I ran, I did this study, you're gonna have to trust me about this. That makes me really uncomfortable, right? And it should make everyone uncomfortable, okay? So reproducible research is about good science. Make it so people's work is not only trusted then based on the faith that you believe this person did good work, right? So it's basically, it's sort of like an elite theory type thing, right? Do you just trust the people out there to have done a good job? No, you probably shouldn't. Okay. So definitions of reproducibility. Uh, so according to Stodden, reproducibility comes in three forms. There's empirical reproducibility. This is just repeatability in data collection. This says if I did the exact same thing, I would get the exact same data. So empirical uh, reproducibility is something that um, a lot of like work has been criticized on and is a common thing people are worried about. So I'm a big fan of a massive amount of like classic ethnographic work and current ethnographic work in criminology, but you have to be reflexive and careful and do proper methods in ethnographic data collection to make your work empirically reproducible, right? Some things people do are things like uh, have multiple raters work on notes and if people come to the same conclusions, it instills more confidence in you. But sometimes it needs to be on the ground. A common thing like a, a book I'm reading right now that I, I quite a bit like, they actually had two ethnographers working independently in the same neighborhood, talking to many of the same people, but not all of them. And then they didn't really compare notes until the end because they wanted their work to be empirically reproducible, right? So this is something that all these things don't really apply. Well, some of them apply purely to quantitative work, but these are also things to be concerned about in any type of research that you do. It's important to be concerned about, right? Next one is statistical reproducibility. Statistical reproducibility means with the same data, you can verify it with alternate methods of inference. So this is just sort of basic robustness tests in your things, right? If you make slightly different assumptions, you might have to go wild with it. different assumptions, you're gonna get similar results. If your results are really sensitive to particular models and things, that does not instill confidence in it and your stuff might not be statistically reproducible, right? The last one is computational reproducibility. This is reproducibility in cleaning, organizing, and presenting data and results. This is everything but the empirical and the statistical parts. This is how did I choose to code my variables up from the raw data? How did I organize them? How did I present my things in tables and plots and things like that? This is computational reproducibility. So R is really well suited to enabling computational reproducibility, right? All the stuff we've been doing with R Markdown is about making your work reproducible and easily readable and understandable for cleaning your data, organizing your data, and presenting it, right? Computational reproducibility is the job of like R, and also I say here Python, because I usually give parts of these slides to other places where they're mostly Python users. Python is equally well suited to doing computational reproducibility. The thing to remember though, is no matter how nicely reproducible your work is, no reproducibility steps will fix flawed research designs and they won't offer a remedy for improper application of statistical methods. So research design and stats knowledge are very difficult things which cannot be automated. So those are things you wanna have skills in. It is not useful to have extensive skills in manually cleaning your data in Excel. That is the thing that can be automated and you don't need to know how to do well. 
that is sort of a waste of your time. If you can make a script easily do something, you're wasting your time by learning how to do it, unless you're somebody who writes the scripts, like writes the code underneath it to do it, right? But learning research design and the stats methods in a deep way, not just like, how do I press Bhutan get statistical results? That's not important. Understanding the assumptions of your models and stuff is complex. So something like my class is really about how do we streamline all this sort of computational reproducibility, reduce the possibility of making mistakes, make things automated so that you can focus more on the proper research design and the stats methods, okay? The only thing that R is gonna help you do is make things computationally reproducible, okay? <clears throat> so what is computational reproducibility? Has a few elements, right? The big one, which is often a giant barrier, is shared data. Something can't be reproducible if researchers don't have access to your original data to verify and replicate your work, right? If you don't share the data, they can't reproduce it. Sometimes there's ways to get around this. There's some R packages that can take a model and generate data that fulfill that has all the same statistical moments as the original data, but are not the original data, so it protects privacy and things like that. That is good. I work a lot with policing data, which is often super secure data. I work with a lot of identifiable data, things like that. I can't share it, but I can sometimes share snippets or simulated equivalents of the data where all my code runs the same way on it. You do what you can, we all have bounds we live within. People who are in sometimes in physical sciences and stuff, it can be often much easier for them to share things because they don't have to deal with certain like um, identifiability. But sometimes they have barriers like, I'd love to share my data, but it's 700 terabytes. That is a problem, right? These things happen, so you share as best as you can. Next one is shared code. You have to share your code to make the decisions you've made transparent. And this is an important way I want people to think about code. A code is a series of decisions you've made about the research you're doing, right? These things are subjective. There is no objective way to clean your data properly, right? This is something that Andrew Gelman calls the, uh, it's like the, um, oh God, it's a, uh, something of forking paths. I forget exactly what he calls it. Um, but the gist of it is that there's an infinite number of decisions constantly being made in every project and it's the garden of forking paths. The paper that you actually get published is the end of one of an infinite series of decisions that are often poorly logged. The, by sharing your code, documenting it, and all that, you provide people with a better idea of the paths you took to do things. And if people understand the paths you took and you've justified them, people have more faith in your work. Rather than hiding the decisions you made, the more you explain the decisions that you made and clearly justify them, the more faith people tend to have in it. There's nothing like getting a review back and people are like, why did you do this? Why did you do this? Why did you do this? None of this makes any sense. But if you send them a paper where you're like, okay, this 15 page appendix, which you're not gonna publish in the final article, tells you everything I did and thought about in these data. Reviewers and editors would be like, okay, that's probably not gonna go in the article. Maybe it's gonna go in the online appendix, but I have no questions about it. I had a paper published in City and Community last year where I had a massive data appendix because there's a lot of selection bias issues in police data and what I was working in. And I just did a massive thing. It's like, this is the documentation of every case dropped from the data set and why. I did not have one question about selection bias in that paper. And it got published in Sitting Community, which is a good journal in my discipline. Just document, just come out and be like, oh yeah, I made a lot of subjective decisions. It probably has effect on my statistical results, but this is what those results probably look like. And this is why I made those decisions. Being open, I mean, it can hurt you. I'm not gonna lie. It can hurt you to be open, but in a good journal, it shouldn't hurt you to be open. Okay. So next thing is documentation. The operation of your code should either be self-documenting, which is a rare thing to attain, but it's possible, or you should have written descriptions that make the use of the code clear. This includes writing documentation in your functions or annotating your code or doing it all in an RMD document that actually really documents everything. You're like, well, now we're doing this and this block, we're doing this and this block, that kind of thing. That documentation is important. If somebody just gives you a script file and it's just all their bizarre um, idiosyncratic R code, it might not even be that helpful they gave it. You might be able to confirm it runs, but if it has lots of like weird manual math and stuff, you may have no idea whether it works or not, but if it's well documented, it can be quite clear. In the professional software development world, if you write bad comments on your code, you get fired, right? Like that's one of the core jobs in software development is writing effective comments. 
it should kind of be the same thing in research or making your code that's mostly self-documenting. This can be somewhat straightforward with tidyverse type stuff, which is a more readable code structure. But as you've probably seen, if, you've if I've sent you any snippets of code that are relatively complex, even then you might look at my code and be like, I have no idea what is happening here, but it works. That's when I would document it if I was providing it to somebody else. The last thing is one that's often overlooked and, and is very familiar to software developers, but often less so to social scientists. This is version control. Version control documents the entire research project if you use version control for your project the whole time, and it prevents losing your work and facilitates sharing. An example of version control is GitHub and using Git version control systems. My class, for instance, is up on Git and is a, or on GitHub and does version control, which means you could go back and see literally every letter by letter change I've ever done to any slide in my entire class. You can see it all documented. You can see the rough start this class had and now where it is now. And I do the same for many of my research projects. I document everything. This can be terrifying to people because it means they could go back and see how a paper started versus how the paper was actually published. I don't think that's that bad. In my experience, the openness is good, but I can understand if it's scary. Yeah. So levels of reproducibility vary a lot from articles. So for academic papers, the base level of reproducibility that you will often get if you email old academics is, if you want to know how I did it, read the damn paper, right? This is not reproducible in any way, unless something is very trivial, right? This works as a level of reproducibility in like hard math, right? You can see all the proofs in there. I'm happy with that, right? I saw some statistics papers where they're reproducible because the text tells you everything they did because it's theoretical, right? This does not apply to basically anything empirical. The next level is shared data with documentation. This is probably the most common level of reproducibility for things that people are actually willing to share with you, right? They're like, okay, I'll give you my data. Maybe I got some documentation like a code book on the data, right? Most people will do that for me. If I email somebody, they'll usually huck me their data with some old documentation they haven't looked at in 10 years. And they're like, okay, I think this is the last file I use for my analyses. The models will work. That's common. The next one is shared data but and all the code to generate it. This is pretty nice. You can at least probably take the raw data and generate their analytical data and run their models. Above that is an interactive document. Your R Markdown documents take something with shared data and all code, but also allow it to all run in some unified thing. Maybe it generates the tables and plots and stuff like that. This is a step above because it can often be a single button press to get out what you want, right? This is nicer, but there's things above an interactive document. For instance, there's research compendiums. A research compendium is basically like an interactive document, but it goes a little bit further by having a uniform structure. I'm gonna talk about this in a second. Then there's also one I'm not gonna talk about, which are Docker compendiums. A Docker compendium is basically a self-contained computing environment, and inside of that is a research compendium. Docker compendiums are like, they would save the version of R and version of all the packages you used to generate the paper, and then you would open it like it was another computer. It's kind of like, almost like logging into a terminal that's frozen in time, and then reproduce everything. That is the extreme. Um, I don't like, I don't think it's a bad idea, but it can be excessive for some things, but sometimes it's great. If you do methods that are computationally very complicated, sometimes the Docker ecosystem can be really nice. Okay, so interactive documents. You all know a lot about interactive documents at this point, because I made you do all your homeworks in them so that you learn them real well and hopefully use them in the future, right? So these interactive documents, like our markdown, combine code and text together into some self-contained document. You can load and process your data, run your models, generate your tables and plots, fill in in-text values. You can do it all in a single document, right? This is really nice. Interactive documents are great because they allow readers to see the computational methods within the document, so they're somewhat self-documenting. People can run the code and see what it pumps out and see where everything goes in like one big flow, right? So it's really nice to be able to hand somebody an RMD for a paper and be like, Here's the whole thing. You want to see how the paper was done? You can run it. Here's the data, okay? So they will reproduce your results with a button press. My favorite projects and most of my projects, to some degree, I can press one button and regenerate the paper. This is really nice. It's kind of nice to be like, I'm compiling my thesis. You press a button and wait, and then your my, my master's thesis just pops out. I'm like, Ha! Ah, the future, right? This feels really good with journal articles and things. Sometimes it's impractical for big projects, but I'll get to that in a minute. 
Okay. So common platforms for this, you know the main one, really. R Markdown is the dominant platform for doing interactive documents uh, in the social sciences. Anyway, uh, Jupyter Notebooks in Python are a common way of doing it in Python, somewhat similar to R Markdown documents. Research compendia are something I haven't talked about in this class. So research compendia are portable, reproducible distributions of articles or projects. So research compendia will begin with an interactive document like an R, mark R Markdown document as a foundation. But then all the files in this project will be organized usually in some recognizable structure. A common way to package them is as an R package. So you could do like install that packages the article and install the article, right? And it will contain it all. There will be a clear separation of data, methods, and output. And a big one in Compendia is your data are always read-only. It has a package like read-only segment for the original data. And then it will have a well-documented or preserved computational environment. Well-documented means when you run the Compendia, it will spit out a file saying the version of the package is used to generate it. Right? This is kind of nice in case some like statistical method or default values change in a package. It documents the version and that would explain why things differ if somebody tries to reproduce it. So there is a framework for doing this. Ben, Mar ben Markwick, Ben Marwick over in uh, um, archaeology here on campus, here on campus, I haven't been on campus in ages, um, has a package called RR Tools that he works with with some collaborators that provides sort of a simplified workflow for making research compendia in R. It's a neat package. It has a lot of features. Some you probably don't need to use, but I tend to, I like to use some of them for some things. Um, I have an example of a research compendia of my own off of my GitHub, which is a, this project on, uh, it's a dynamic intrafamily model of child behavior problems and birth timing. You can actually see the paper generated by the R package here. You can see it has embedded like graphics. These graphics are dynamically generated with the model fits like inserted in them when they're generated. And then you know it's a, a research compendia because when you go down to the bottom after references, it lists every R package that was installed at the time I last run it. So I last ran this for using R 3.5.2 using all of these packages, right? This is a research compendia. So when I generated this little research article that's right here, which is obviously an incomplete article, it says how everything was generated. This is a research compendia. It's kind of a cool way to bundle your shit. Okay. So that's neat. I think our tools can do, I mean, can do a lot of stuff you don't necessarily do, but the idea of it is really nice. It's sort of a uniform way to package your stuff. Bookdown is a package in R, which is integrated into R tools, but it's also its own separate thing for generating documents in the format you would do articles, theses, books, and dissertations. So this is a general package for doing books, dissertations, and theses in Markdown instead of LaTeX, okay? So Bookdown is the package behind all of these online R textbooks you've seen, like R for Data Science. That's a Bookdown book. And in fact, they pressed one button that rendered that website, but also generated the O'Reilly print version of that book, because Bookdown generates in multiple formats like the homeworks that you do. Okay, gonna write a book? You can do it in Bookdown. A lot of comp stats textbooks in R nowadays were all written in Bookdown. So they have an online version, they've got that. They're actually all written in this package. Okay, so what Bookdown does is it provides this nice accessible alternative to writing all that garbage LaTeX for typesetting and reference management. Don't learn LaTeX, just do it all in Bookdown and let it handle the LaTeX for you. So you can do things with Bookdown like integrate citations and automate reference paste generations with Zotero. If so, if you have all your citations in Zotero, you can just pull a BibTeX file from that and it will automatically do all the citations throughout the entire document. So if you cite something in the text, it will add it to the reference section appropriately. If it's not cited in the text, it removes it from the site, the like reference section, and it will do it in whatever format you want. This is how I do most of my references and stuff. I just have them dynamically inserted. Bookdown, of course, supports output in many different formats. It will do HTML output for websites and sharing with people, but it will render PDFs through LaTeX if you want them to be publication ready. It means you can give it a template. If you want it to look like a particular style of book or something, you can just render it that way. The nice thing about that, the University of Washington's theses and dissertations have a LaTeX template. Then Marwick adapted Bookdown as the Husky Down package, which will render UW dissertations and theses using the LaTeX template without you writing any LaTeX. So you can use Bookdown to get the proper format for y'all's dissertations and theses and not have to use the, those templates. 
it'll look nice the way you want it to. You don't have to mess with the tough stuff. I highly recommend that package for doing that kind of stuff. Teach you a little bit of book down, save you a bunch of time, looks real pretty. Okay, so the next thing I wanna talk about outside of reproducibility are best practices. So my opinions, which are of course the best practices in organizations and organization and portability. So organizing your research projects is something you either do accidentally and badly or purposefully with a little bit of upfront labor. The latter is usually better. Uniform organization of your projects makes switching between them and revisiting them a lot easier, okay? So I suggest you structure your projects something like this. This is a very general format. You do whatever you want, but the sort of hierarchy to it is useful. So here, there's a clear hierarchy. All the written content for my projects are in documents. All my code is in syntax. Uh, my data is always in data, which is split into derived data. This is data generated as I go along and raw data, which is a read only directory having my original data in it, okay? All my naming is uniform. It's all lowercase, words are separated by underscores and every name is descriptive. You would never have any doubt where to find any type of file in the structure. And if you go on my computer, I've got about a hundred projects on here which have exactly this data structure or this uh, file structure, which means if I ever want to know where to find anything in any project, I know where it's at because every file has the same structure, okay? This is really nice. It takes a little bit of work, but it means you'll never lose anything because everything is exactly the same structure, okay? And then, of course, I make it so this entire project, every single one of them is usually in our uh, studio project. Makes it easy to manage, okay? And also, they're also usually a uh, GitHub repository, okay? So, Another thing, to summarize Jenny Bryan, Jenny Bryan is a giant in the R community up at, up at UBC, one of the core people in the tidyverse, and one of the best people out there talking about proper workflows for research and things like that. She basically writes the gospel in this area. I highly recommend reading the stuff that she puts out. So to summarize Jenny Bryan, you should separate your workflow from your projects, okay? So workflow are things like the software you use to write your code, that is your R Studio or whatever, the location you store your projects, your specific computer, and any code you ran earlier or typed into your console. This is all workflow stuff and it should be kept separate from a project, right? It should be independent. The project is the raw data you're using, the code, that is the syntax that operates on it, any packages you use, and the output files or documents, okay? So these things should be kept, there should be a firewall between them. You should be able to remove or ignore anything on the left side here and have everything on the right side work perfectly, okay? So this is a principle which, as it turns out, can be surprisingly easy to accomplish. So projects should not modify anything outside of the project, nor should a person need to modify anything in them to run them. So true reproducible research uh, adheres to the standard where everything in the project is independent of workflow, right? A good project, all the stuff is independent. So I sort of try to live this in a really strict way where I work on multiple computers and freely move between them, never write a directory like a direct directory for anything like that. I just jump between computers and it never matters. I could have my desktop computer and my laptop both catch on fire simultaneously. And as long as the OneDrive servers at Microsoft aren't hit by a meteor, I will lose nothing and nothing matters, okay? So. For research to be reproducible, it must abide by that separation, which makes your software or makes your research portable. Portable software is software that in operates independently of your workflow, things like fixed file locations, okay? So to make something portable, do not do any of these things, which I have harped on people all term not to do. For something to be portable, don't use set working directory in your scripts or RMD files. Set working directory is pro almost always going to be particular to a system. If you use it, your work is no longer portable. If you give your project to someone else, it won't work. Never use absolute paths for anything except for fixed immovable data sources like secure data drives, right? Do not do read CSV C colon whatever because everybody's computer is set up in a different way and they might copy your, your thing to a different location. You might have it in a different location on a different computer. If you buy a new computer and you accidentally give it a different username than your old computer, you don't want every file path in every one of your projects to break, right? It's kind of dumb. Don't use these absolute paths. 
The exception for this is like removable drives that will have a fixed thing. Maybe you work on a CSD server, something like that. It's always in this like K drive or something. That makes sense, okay? Another thing, never put install.packages in a script or in your RMD files. You do not want somebody to reproduce your research and install shit they don't want. That is considered a big no-no. It pisses people off. One thing it might do is overwrite their version of it. If there's a newer version they don't want to use, that kind of thing drives you up the wall, right? Another thing, never put rm list equals ls anywhere but your console. This is a thing you'll often see older school R people or people who taught themselves R put at the beginning of a script file. rm list equals ls clears the global environment. It only clears the global environment. It doesn't like clear things loaded in the background. Okay, the thing is, is if I'm reproducing your research and I accidentally run lm list equals ls, but I had something in the background that took five hours to run, I lost my five hours of things and I am very angry at you. Don't put this in, in scripts. It's okay to use it in your console to clear stuff so you know you're doing it, but it shouldn't be something run every time something runs. Things to do though are use RStudio projects or the here package to set directories. So if you don't want to use RStudio projects, but you want relative pathing, the here package does something kind of like RStudio uh, projects for managing within project working directories. Next thing, use relative paths to do everything. Load everything with instead being like go into my data folder in my data CSV. If I copy and paste the entire project to some other drive on my computer, this will always work as long as those things don't get rearranged. Do it that way. All packages you need to use, load them with library in the script of the RMD. Don't expect somebody's going to do library something in the console and then run your script. That's probably not going to happen. They're going to be left scratching their heads why some function doesn't work. Uh, and then a big one, which I harp on mostly in Slack, is Make it so every time you close our studio, it deletes everything loaded. Go to tools, global options, save workspace, and say never. This assures that every time you reopen our studio, it's starting fresh. And I open and close my R studio all the time. Okay? So if you've separated your project from your workflow, this will work perfectly fine. Okay. If it doesn't work, it's an indication you didn't separate those things. <clears throat> Next. So often you need to divide and conquer. So often you don't want to include all the code for a project in one RMD. I have a lot of projects that have enormous bodies of code. I want to put them all into one 50 page RMD file, right? This results in things like code that takes too long to knit or a file so long it's difficult to read, okay? You don't, you aren't stuck with one document. You've got options. One way is to use multiple R scripts or RMD files, and when they run, they will save the results from their operations. So if you have complicated parts that take a while to run, you run them separately, and then they export their results either as an R file or as a CSV or something, and then you load these results in your RMD and display them. The way I usually have my RMDs for final documents is they don't run almost any actual code in them. They load the tables, the plots and everything externally and bring them in. And instead, every one of those tables, plots, all that have their own little file for them. Okay. This is really good if you need to load and clean big data. You only want to do it once, not every time you knit the paper. It's also good for slow models. If you got something that's got to run overnight, you don't want to do it every time you knit the paper. The other option is to use the source function to run external R scripts when the RMD knits. So if you say source and then the name of an R script, your R file as it knits will go to it, go there, open that R file, run everything in it before it continues and goes. This is something good where you have a really large script file, but it's fast to run, or you have a bunch of functions you wanna use in it, but you don't wanna package everything as an actual package, okay? These are two different ways to go about it. So the thing I call the way of many files, which is what is known to software developers as the only way to write actual code, um, I find it beneficial to break projects into many, many files. I will have scripts with specialized functions, scripts that load and clean each set of variables will get its own script, scripts that run each set of models, scripts that run each set of tables and plots many, many scripts. I was just working on a project and I just checked and it has 75 scripts in the top level directory. I'm like, that's getting a little out of control. I got to start bundling this shit. But still, you know, it breaks it up. And then one main RMD file that will run some of these or the results of them to reproduce the whole project. Okay. So you're breaking everything up. Breaking it up like this carries a bunch of benefits. One thing is that once one portion of the project is done in its own file, it's out of your way. You don't have to mess with it. If it works, you set it aside and you don't have to worry about it anymore. 
If you need to make changes, you're not searching through one big file to figure out where to make the change. You open one file, and I like to have my files where all the code fits on one or two screens, right? I can find what I need to change in there. I just edit it. I'm good to go. All I need to worry about is how to find that script file. And if you use good naming conventions, it's easy to find. Another thing is it means entire sections of a project can be added or removed quickly, right? So maybe I have an entire appendix in an article. It's not going to be in the final article. I just don't include the appendix file and it doesn't generate the appendix, right? I can excise an entire segment of the project just by removing the file or not running it. Another thing though, this is a big one for people in actual software development. This is the only way to build a proper pipeline for a project. So what is a pipeline? Pipelines known to professional researchers and, uh, and like software development teams are the way you organize a proper project or piece of software. So a pipeline is a series of consecutive processing elements, things like scripts and functions in R. Each stage of your pipeline will have clearly defined inputs and outputs. It will not modify its inputs in any way. You don't have things that feed backward and it produces the exact same output every time that section is run, right? So this means if you modify one stage, the only thing you have to rerun are subsequent stages to it. If you have something that took a really long time to run earlier, you don't have to rerun it, you just run the later stuff. It also means because the inputs and outputs don't change in format, different people can work on every single stage. The type of input and output doesn't change, so they can modify the code within so long as the inputs and outputs are standardized. This is how big companies do everything. People work in modules. It always takes the same input and output, but they can modify the content of it and things will stay working. It also means all problems end up isolated in one stage. If there's a problem somewhere, it's going to be some stage that has that problem. Things don't propagate outside of it. You don't have to browse through one big thing. If something's going wrong, it's going wrong somewhere. A nice thing about this whole structure, though, is it allows you to depict your entire project as something called a directed graph of dependencies. This is what a pipeline looks like if you design them nicely. I like to draw my software development pipelines for projects like this. Every stage of it is an R script or something, which is an oval. It has an unambiguous input and output, and everything that precedes a given stage is a dependency, something which must be there to run it. Here, I load up a couple CSV files. I have a load R loading script. This produces a full data.R data file. Then it gets used in two places. Here, it gets reshaped into data for my models. Here, it gets put into descriptives. This produces a table of descriptives as a PDF. This runs, uh, reshapes my data for my models, runs the models here, and then produces a model table and plots. Then the model table, the plots, and the descriptive tables all go into an RMD paper, which spits out a PDF of my paper. Okay, This is a pipeline for a simple project. Sometimes these projects can spiral wildly out of control. But the neat thing about it is you can actually automate the entire design and management of the pipeline using Drake if you want to go a little crazy. So Drake in R is a platform for doing directed uh, dependencies. So this right here is a dynamically generated plot of all the dependencies for a particular project. It generates this by reading all of your R scripts and their definitions and figuring out how all these things link together based on some definitions you set. So for a complex project, you could see how every part of it fits together. And the neat thing about Drake is, if you modify a piece of code, it can then be told to only rerun the dependent stages. So you can have your entire project, if you make a few edits to the code, you can press one button and it will rerun the thing you change and the things that depend on it and nothing that occurs earlier in the chain. So if you work on a big research team with big projects, Drake will automate all this pipeline management for you. It's really powerful and really nice. And this package is developed by the uh, R Open Science uh, like foundation. This is where reproducibility research in R comes from, is this group. Drake is amazing. Got big projects, I recommend Drake. I mostly do it manually because my stuff is small time. Okay. 
So uh, we're at 520, so we're technically at time. I'm going to keep ranting for just a little bit longer here. It's the last day. You stuck with me. Feel free to go, though. I understand people have time limits and things like that. I'm going to go kind of fast because this is mostly just my opinions, and then I want to wrap things up. Okay. So uh, some opinionated advice. Um, I will tell you quite strongly that I believe that you should not use closed source or commercial software in file formats unless they're absolutely necessary. Almost all proprietary software is bad for science and you should stop using it. Open source, file and for source, uh, open source software and file formats are generally better. They're better for science always because I think people should be able to explore your research without paying for commercial software, right? Even something like Stata requires a license to use. So it's dumb to make people be like, you can't reproduce my stuff unless you pay $120 for a license, free software. Another thing is, is that you don't want your research to suddenly be inaccessible when software gets updated. This is a Stata type thing. They move to a new version. They're like, ah, let's make it so none of the data is compatible anymore with the old versions. Oh my God, this drives you insane. And also even software like Word saves its files, not as raw text, but as proprietary files. You can only open in Word or something they have paid a license to be able to open Word files. It's ridiculous. Everybody should be able to open stuff without paying for software. So another thing is that often the software itself is actually just better, right? Open source software is often updated more quickly. It's usually more secure and it's really rarely abandoned. Some of the most commonly used open source software is Emacs and Vim, those ancient text editors who began in the 80s. People still use this stuff all the time and are constantly doing development on it. Open source people don't abandon anything, right? And they tend to be rock solid secure because nerds are obsessed with security. Things are usually bulletproof, right? Okay. So on formats, like I said, uh, okay. Uh, so I forgot one thing. The ideal though, and this is a thing Kieran Healy has a great textbook on, ideally always use software that just reads and writes raw text, ASCII files and text. If you work purely in text, your stuff will be accessible for all eternity. I can open an ASCII file written in the 50s. It works perfectly fine. Okay, You can't say that about a Word document. Good Lord, if you have to open an original Word perfect document or something like that, that stuff just breaks in weird ways. Text doesn't break. Okay, So writing and formatting documents. So this is a thing that Microsoft has been lying to you for many years. Writing a document and formatting a document are two different jobs, right? It used to be that there were writers and editors and never the two did meet, right? These are two totally different jobs. Writing is something you do first. After you're done writing, you format things. This is what Markdown was made for, to make it so you just write everything and you worry about how to format it later, okay? Word processors like Word try to make you do both at the same time and usually make you do both of them worse, right? So this leads to a massive waste of your time. You spend time doing things like, oh, should this be bold? What font size should this be? These are ways to procrastinate. If you're working in raw text, you couldn't waste your time with these things. Instead, you'd have to confront the text mortality of having to actually write your paper, right? I can't just sit here and play with formats, okay? Anyway, I recommend you find a good modular text editor, learn how to use it. I use Atom, Sublime is really nice. God forbid you like Emacs or Vim, you do you. Uh, our studio is not a bad general purpose text editor, but it's not as expandable as something like Atom, right? Okay. So I still use Word if I'm writing something that has literally no computational component to it, or I'm working with my advisor who's addicted to Word. Otherwise, raw text. And it's hard to wean yourself off. These are absolutes. I still use Word for those things. I'm calling myself out to you. I shame myself on this. Okay. So. Uh, I'm actually going to skip over version control. If you're interested, you can take a peek at it. The idea with version control is you can use like Git or GitHub to document every change you've ever done to anything. Um, it's a really good way to organize and handle all that sort of thing. Um, this class is hosted on the GitHub repository. Uh, if you're going to go into a job in the private or public sector at a technically competent firm or organization, I highly recommend you load your projects that have a software component like R onto GitHub or something because people who are doing uh, like recruiting at these places and looking at job apps will look at your GitHub, will look at your code. Your GitHub or similar thing is a documentation that you are a technically competent person in what you're doing. And this can make a big difference at some types of jobs. 
academic hiring, people are less likely to look at your GitHub, though I was just on two hiring committees for my department and I sure as hell looked at their GitHub accounts to see what they, the chops they had. Turns out they all had mad chops and I felt inadequate, but you can still like look at these things. It's a good idea. This is huge if you're planning to go into the private sector, have a GitHub, put your stuff on it and eventually it becomes routine. It's kind of a nice thing you updated. I host this whole class on it because I think it's a nice platform. Okay, anyway, now I'm gonna wrap up the course here with just a few like final things. So, so far, theoretically, you have taken sips from the fire hose and possibly learned or at least been exposed to a lot of different things. So I understand this is an overwhelming course for one credit. It's kind of the idea though, is to blast you with a bunch of stuff and then hopefully you can refer back to it and then in your own time develop and use these things. Blast you with it first because it's the only option I've got to reach people with this stuff because they won't give me a four credit class. Do what we can. So you've picked up things like getting your data in and out of R, doing basic manipulation and cleaning of data, a bunch on visualization. I have shown you loops and writing functions in sort of a simple way. That's a huge thing you can get deeper into, right? I have shown you dynamic documents and all that. I've also played around with things like acquiring and working with spatial data, a rarely encountered thing, right? We've covered a million different topics in a short, uh, traumatic 10 weeks of madness going on throughout the world, which I have only added to. Um, but yes, we've covered a lot of stuff, right? So if you felt overwhelmed throughout the course, I totally understand. That happens like that. I'm also wanting to expose you to it, but know that all the resources you've seen in this course are supposing a meteor doesn't strike GitHub or civilization collapses entirely, which I kind of expect in June. Um, but we'll see. Theoretically, my stuff is publicly available for all eternity right? Use it as a resource, do that kind of thing. And also in the future, shoot me emails and stuff. I don't mind taking a look at people's stuff. So what will come next for you in theory, right? Um, you might use this R knowledge you have now to have a better grasp on future stats and CSSS courses, right? So instead of going into some CSSS course and being utterly traumatized by having to learn how to code R, you've picked up enough that maybe it won't be so bad. You can go take courses in things like, you know, hierarchical models, survey design, go take machine learning stuff somewhere else. This stuff is a lot easier to deal with if you know some basic R code and it's easier to use on your own once you know how to get your data in the proper format, which is usually a, a tidy long format format, right? Um, and now in this class also, I've kind of showed you some basic stuff about using the output of the models you might learn in those classes using things like Broom, GGFX, blah, 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 right? Um, my recommendation for everyone is uh, everything you've learned in this class will uh, leak out of your ears rapidly if you don't work on it on your own, right? Um, the, diff the sort of disadvantage of a hose-like class like this is it goes as out as easily as it goes, like those sips go in, um, it'll disappear. I recommend doing things like maybe just take analyses you've done in other software and replicate them. Maybe post them online as blog posts or GitHub things so you can use them for like a job application later or something like that. Um, think about applying and using this stuff in projects going forward in your classes and stuff like that, right? Do your homework assignments as R markdown documents. Do them in R even if the class doesn't necessarily do them. I actually do all my class slides for even like my criminology class I'm teaching next term, which obviously has no R code in it. I'm doing all my slides in R just because it kind of keeps me fresh on this stuff, right? I do all my stuff in it. It's just a way to keep it constantly fresh. Blog posts are really nice. You can throw something up on your Twitter, you know, mess with stuff, find things that interest you. Uh, one of my really good friends is constantly doing um, uh, basketball analytics as his own hobby thing. He just uses, he does it in Python because he's like, he's a Python person, basketball analytics. Um, my roommate has done stuff with soccer analytics um, and stuff and just being like, oh, how do I pick like, what would be historically speaking, he does a great um, memo on um, if I could assemble the best possible soccer team of all time of people who'd never been on the same team, how do I do it? And he did it algorithmically by ranking players and all these different things and then having it di use lists of every team they ever played for to assemble this roster for and be like, they can never have been on the same team, not just at the same time, but ever. Fun stuff like that. Think about projects you wanna do. Um, I also write my websites in our studio and stuff like that. Just a way to like keep it fresh, okay? Um, you might also look at more advanced projects going forward. Like I talk about using version control. You can implement version control in our studio, do it all and integrate it. Um, maybe you wanna make, do things like interactive web dashboards and stuff with Shiny. You can do some really cool stuff in R we didn't cover in this class. Um, maybe just you have basic functions you use in all of like the work you do. Try and make a little package. It's just a way to keep you fresh, right? Okay, so 
I make a few course plugs here, generally in the uh, department here, for things you might want to do in the future. So if you took my class boldly without having any kind of stats background, um, a good class to go from this is to go into like 504 in the sociology department, which is applied social statistics. Okay? This is a good class typically taught by one of my favorite professors in the department. Uh, excellent class in basic stats. Okay? Um, if you've only finished something equivalent to like Social 506 or your grad program's basic stats sequence, the next jump into the deep end is Chris Adolph's maximum likelihood class. Maximum likelihood is sort of the basis for almost all statistical methods you'll commonly encounter out there. Even, you know, all the Bayesian methods include a likelihood component to them. It's nice to know about maximum likelihood. If you want to learn fundamentals of visualization, Chris Adas visualizing data class is really good because it really gets into the theory of how to make good visualizations. What makes up something that's understandable and digestible to people, the cognition of it and everything in addition to uh, code and procedures, okay? Uh, if you're gonna study event data or durations, like you're interested in modeling how much time until something happens or whether something happened or not, it turns out you can't use normal statistical methods for this for a variety of reasons. You need event history methods for this. And CSSS 544 is a really good introduction to event history. It's also a really good introduction to maximum likelihood analysis. Uh, if you want to do work with network data, social network analysis is its own little sphere of statistics. And we have terrific network scholars at the University of Washington. We're an absolute hub for network research. So this would be a really good class for that kind of thing. If you're going to work with spatial data, uh, John Wakefield teaches spatial statistics. This is a like world-class course in modern spatial stats. It's daunting. Don't take it as your first class, probably after like your initial stats sequence. But if you really want to get into spatial stats, it's dynamite. And John Wakefield is hilarious and amazing. Um, he is a surly English Englishman um, from uh, Leicester City, and they were actually winning the uh, um, cup at the time. And so he had a nice soccer rant at the end of every class period when I took it. I love John Wakefield. He's fantastic. Total gem. Uh, another one is if you want to work with time series data, Chris Edoff again does a time series and panel data class. You got to work with longitudinal stuff. Highly recommend the class. It's very good. And there's also a more advanced version by Elena Rocheva for after you've taken that. So that is about it uh, for this term. So thanks for bearing with me from taking sips from the fire hose. Um, I hope you found this class useful, not completely overwhelming, especially given the completely online format, the madness of uh, this term on so many different levels. Um, thanks for bearing with me. I hope everyone is healthy and well and uh, generally doing okay. I hope you have good summers um, and I hope we all sort of make it through this sort of thing. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. Thank you no so pleasure. Much. What you got? Thanks so much, Chuck. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs>